think we are good. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and thanks for joining us for another virtual event. And tonight we have Kath Catherine Prendergast with us. And she's gonna be talking about her brand new book, The Gilded Edge, let me get the subtitle correct, Two Audacious Women and the Cyanide Love Triangle That Shook America. And she has a, a multimedia presentation lined up for us, but um, I'm gonna be monitoring the comments so if you have questions for Catherine, go ahead and put them in and uh, I'll be happy to reemerge and ask any questions you might have. So Barbara, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Wow, you know, the, the whole true crime thing, the podcast, which in my opinion, podcasts are a reversion to the radio of my childhood, but that was a wonderful way to take in things, um, has just gone crazy. And I, I love the fact that this book reminds us that true crime is not a modern phenomenon, but as a matter of fact, as a you know millennial old um, tradition. And this one takes us back to, to California um, at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, we have lots to talk about, but just so you know who Catherine is, she is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She's also a Guggenheim Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. I'm so impressed. I'm already feeling <laughs> inferior. Um, she's been interviewed by NPR and New York Magazine. She writes about battles over school desegregation um, and all kinds of other things, especially the recognition of disability rights. And her previous scholarly books include Buying into English, and literacy and racial justice. Now, anybody who knows anything about academia knows that the basic slogan is publish or perish. Um, yeah. So, you know, anybody who's going to be successful, especially in your field, obviously has to publish works, but apparently there is some um, latitude in what you wanna write, or do you feel, Catherine, yeah. that you are compelled to write nonfiction all the time? No, I mean, oh, so the first two books would be scholarly monographs that go in libraries and the main um, audience for that is scholars in the field and graduate students who are studying. But this is my first book of narrative nonfiction for trade for the general reader and the story when I began to uncover it, um, I, I completely shifted and realized this is a story everyone would enjoy. You know, this is not just for scholars. And uh, and when I tell you about the incredible events, you'll understand why. But um, first, I wanted to ask you, Barbara, you know, um, you mentioned that you have some West Coast background. What do you think of when you think of Carmel and the Monterey Peninsula? What do I think of? Well, I have to say that when I first encountered it as a refugee from Chicago, um, <laughs> the weather, the weather, I, one of the reasons I went to Stanford, in fact, was the, that experience, you know, um, the more benign climate. The, at that time, California was really, um, really on the cutting edge people, you know, uh, there was an enormous glamour to California. Um, there was, uh, people were, Moving West was sort of a Horace Greeley continuation thing. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, Stanford in 1958, which is the year that I entered um, my freshman class, was not the world-class university that we think of today. And one of the reasons it became so was that they had um, the gift of enormous amount of land. And land is a theme that we're in development, something we're going to be talking about in Catherine's book, The Gilded Edge. And Stanford was able to raid really great Ivy League professional talent in teaching, not only by offering them a better living wage, but by providing housing because the university had so much land, they were able to build really gorgeous housing for their faculty. Right. And, right. Um, you know, people who are crouched in some three, you know, <laughs> two story or two flat, sorry, let me try again. Two room apartment, you know, somewhere near Cambridge on a, on a low salary because it was such an honor to teach at Harvard that it didn't really matter if you got paid a living wage, flocked west. And My father was a Columbia University professor, so we're all over that. But uh, yes, Stanford's history as well as Carmel's history is um, defined by the railroad and railroad money. And- um, absolutely. And it is said the Stanford's went east and said to the president of Harvard, like, how much, how much to do all this? He's like, well, it's not really a matter because 
no, how much? And the guy gives him a number and he goes, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, right. But since you asked me specifically about Monterey and Carmel, my, my roommate, um, or right, right in the freshman dorm, um, was from Monterey. Her family was from Monterey. Her father, in fact, owned the Mercedes dealership in Monterey, which is pretty nifty. And she had her own horse in Stanford, proving that the Mercedes people paid pretty well. Um, and so I had an opportunity to visit um, the peninsula. And there are two ways. Well, if you, if you wanted to drive from San Francisco, Palo Alto to Los Angeles, you had two choices, back, and you probably still do. One of which is the Camino Real, which is kind of an inland way, which has been replaced by Interstate 5. But the other was that you would drive down south and then you would branch over trying to remember exactly where, and you would take the Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 1, which was hazardous because sometimes it just fell into the sea, parts of it, and there was, there was no way forward, so you had to retreat backward. But as a result, Monterey and Carmel were somewhat isolated. It wasn't all that easy to get there. And right. Carmel, um, Carmel was a, a, a lot, I mean, it's very... Bohe it was very considered very bohemian then. Lots of artists, you know, um, of different kinds, writers and artists, and and there were a lot of cottages. I mean, it was a mm -hmm. relatively small scale thing. So um, when you see it today, you'll see what yes. are called the Hugh Comstock cottages, which were all in the twenties, yeah. um, built around the twenties, and they're gorgeous. They look like they come out of a storybook. They're so so you're, you're, yeah. They're yeah, very, almost like Hansel and Gretel cottages. Absolutely. You know, cottages. So that's and very small businesses, uh, yes. very small, um, but um, excellent restaurants. And then there was the 17 mile drive, which I have to say, mm -hmm. Catherine, is a knockout. It's I a mean, knockout and everyone should go see it. So I'm going to talk about Carmel's early history yes. when it came to be. And now it is a very affluent um, community. Yeah. Uh, full of galleries, if not artists, because it's hard to actually live in Carmel on an artist salary anymore, yeah. but, and, and absolutely a place people go on vacation. And I, I, I've joked that, you know, when scientists have an ideal project in mind, they write a grant for um, the effects of champagne on lobster. So they get to have both around a lot. And I felt like a research project into Carmel's history was the humanities equivalent because I had to go to Carmel a lot. <laughs> Well, poor you, but I, I want to say that it really has upscaled and, you know, it's the, very upscaled. wasn't that long ago, right? right? Um, but it truly has um, upscaled in a way that I, I would not recognize as easily. And, oh, and, and Clint Marie, Eastwood. Cannery yep. kind of a town, you know, Cannery was a very working town. I mean, Steinbeck, yeah. all that. Um, Monterey too has become yeah. far more upscale, but but their piece of the California coast is magnificent and will it's always gorgeous. be monetized. Okay, I'm gonna, to, to be able to show you some of that, I'm going to go to the presentation. So, you know, as by what you were just saying, um, it winds up being a little secluded, right? And that's to its benefit. It preserved its beauty, um, you know, over the ages. And when you read books about Carmel today, it says it was founded in the early 20th century. And it talks about the Bohemians who wound up there when it was there was hardly anything there. And they just stumble upon this landscape and decide, you know, here's a place where we can dwell, live off the earth and uh, create good art. And what I'm going to tell you is that story is a fabrication. And um, it has a lot to do with some of these events that happened. Okay, but before we get to Carmel proper, um, so at the time Carmel was founded, we are at the tail end, the edge of the Gilded Age, and we're entering a time of huge technological industrial change, and also a time of huge social change. And there was an entity known as the New Woman. Um, they talked about at the time and historians still talk about today. And she sort of represented their reading the paper. She's not staying demurely at home. She's getting out there in the world. She will ride a bicycle. She might even publish something. And um, she might even try to vote, you know, or be working towards that. 
Okay, so that was a real phenomenon. What I noticed, however, um, as I was doing this research at the time, you notice this illustration is copyright 1901. So this is the year before Carmel was founded. Um, there never was any mention of a new man. <laughs> we never really talked about a new man. In fact, there wasn't a new man. So the guy on the right who's doing the laundry and everything while she's reading the paper, that actually never happened. One of the very commodified elements, though, of the new woman was, and these might be familiar illustrations to people, they were in the magazines, which were exploding because women were reading. So you had the ladies home journal, you know, for example, and people were reading that. And so Charles Dana Gibson uh, would do these illustrations of uh, uh, new women called the, eventually the Gibson girls after him. And they all have this sort of updo, you know, that was the big thing, a kind of blousey top a cinched waist, like corset cinched, and then this long skirt, but almost more um, really kind of defining of the new woman was the pose, the pose of assuredness, of confidence, of like, I can attract a man, but I know who I am. Okay, these are George and Car Carrie Sterling facing you. These are the um, Bohemians who supposedly started the, the settlement at Carmel. Now, Carrie Sterling, I want you to notice, is like a new woman Gibson girl. She's got the updo, the blousey top, the, you know, cinched waist, and the long skirt. Now, she actually grew up really poor. It's, there's two heroines in my book, and she's one of them. Um, her police captain dad dies in his 40s, leaving five children. And so through census records, I figured out that her mom moved closer to the Oakland docks at that point, a terminus for the Transcontinental Railway and open up, used her house for boarders, which meant that, you know, Carrie was helping out when she lived there with the boarders. Now, Carrie has had enough of being poor by the time she's, you know, 18, 19, and she decides she is going to marry and marry up. She's one of the early um, group of women to work in an office. Uh, she gets a job um, and there she meets George Sterling, who uh, she marries in short order. Who is George Sterling? He's talked a lot about in San Francisco. He was once the poet laureate of um, California. He has a whole park on Russian Hill, like, uh, you know, dedicated to him. Um, but who was he really, you know? So he is the protege of Ambrose Bierce and Jack London's best friend. He was known at the time as the King of Bohemia because he had all these artistic friends and uh, they would go to this big restaurant in San Francisco called Kappa's. They'd, they'd paint on the walls, they'd sketch people who were coming in, you know, and they, they, he would compose poetry and read it to people aloud. And so they basically ran that joint. Kappa's didn't have to have a dancing girl or an orchestra. They had the Bohemians, okay? Um, he was also simultaneously uh, a land developer. He was the bookkeeper and eventually the vice president of the Realty Syndicate, which was the second biggest land developer in the Bay Area. So you have this uh, Pacific Improvement Company, which belonged to the Southern Pacific Railroad, and then you have the Realty Syndicate. And what they did was the syndicate bought up all this depressed farmland in uh, Alameda, Oakland area, and Berkeley towards the hills, turned it into residential lots. Um, so they wanted to make basically the suburbs and attract the wealthy people. And eventually the Piedmont, this is a map from one of their brochures, became known as a city of millionaires because of the wealth that settled there. In order to do that, to get people to move there, they had to move people across the bay quickly to work. And so the other thing they did was carve this, the, erect this 5,000, meter pier that went out towards Yerba Buena Island, which was at the time Goat Island, takes a left. And then the ferries to Market Street, where the financial district in San Francisco is, take off from there. So they shade time off the commute and they made it viable. The other thing George Sterling, who started the Carmel Colony, had his hooks in was the Bohemian Club. The Bohemian Club was an early club where businessmen, and it's still very active, rubbed shoulders with artistic types. And they had a motto, weaving spiders come not here, which meant we don't do deals, we're devoted to art. And every summer they do two weeks in the Sonoma Hills um, out there by the Russian river. 
And that became kind of famous for a, you know, excess and debauchery <laughs> time. But they also put on a play and did other things. So at that picture, you see uh, Sterling in the middle seated next to him. That's Jack London, who we took often to the Bohemia Club. And that's Porter Garnet, another friend who was in the arts. Okay, so Sterling came from money. He had money at the time he moved to Carmel. He didn't just decide to move to Carmel. Another figure who was a member of the Bohemian Club that people don't talk about much was Frank Powers, an attorney who bought this little red square mile of real estate. And Frank Powers tried everything to get people to move to that little square mile. Now, note where it is on the map. Monterey is up on top. The Southern Pacific Railroad comes right to Monterey. Next to that, the railroad company's land department arm did the sumptuous Hotel Del Monte, which has like 500 rooms, ornamental gardens, you know, a paddle pond, a racetrack, bathhouses. So if you were wealthy in San Francisco in 1900, you could just take the train down for the weekend, get a place in Monterey, and then, you know, have a great time and go back up. So Powers figured all he had to do, they, he thought, he was sure they told him the railway would extend to Carmel. He's like, great, that'll triple the month that, you know, this, but he, so he buys the land, but at the time he buys it, the three miles to Monterey is just a dirt track and a very uncomfortable ride. And so he had a lot of problems attracting people to it. This is a photograph that people always associate with early Carmel. Here we have the Bohemians, George Sterling, you know, the supposed founder, Mary Austin next to him, who was a, a known woman writer, a new woman, um, writer of the American West. That's Jack London making some point over there. And next to him, Jimmy Hopper, another short story writer who's becomes pivotal in the story. They are in front of one of the rare structures in Carmel, um, the bathhouse that was there when, when Powers bought it. And so this features in a lot of coffee table books is like, this is the moment the artists decide they want to move there. Sorry, I have to go one back, but this is how the picture was actually taken. It was very staged. Arnold Genta is in the foreground as a photographer and people might remember him as the guy who took all the photos from the San Francisco earthquake. And he has, they just got Jack London down for the weekend. Jack London actually didn't buy into Carmel. He never spent more than a month there in his life. But this photo circulated everywhere, ensured that whenever Carmel was mentioned, Jack London would be mentioned in the same breath. I also want you to notice behind the log how all the women are kind of like off to the side, right? They're kind of playing a supporting role and Carrie's among them. And she is feeding and housing all these people who come through while her husband engages in a great time. Here's George Sterling, her husband, okay? Um, this photo is in the Harrison Memorial Library, but I believe it was too taken by Genta around the same time. That's an abalone shell in front of George Sterling. And abalone was very much part of George Sterling's selling point. So, you know how you buy a timeshare these days? Like uh, somebody says, oh, there's this great property. It's really fun. Come on down. You just have to sit through two hours of spiel, right? And then, you know, you'll have a great time otherwise. And they show you a good time and then they try to get you to buy. Well, this is exactly what George Sterling did. And he had, uh, he had a program that he took almost everyone through. He would pick them up in Monterey. He would take them to the Hotel Del Monte for lunch. He would then take them on the sumptuous 17 mile drive that was already carved out by the Pacific Improvement Company. Then he would put them up either at his house where Carrie had to take care of them or in the one hotel. And the next day they would all go to Point Lobos and he would strip down and swim for abalone. And the fun part was for all these people to like pound the abalone for an hour so it's tender enough for the grill. And then they could put it on the grill and eat it. And they would think up verses while they're pounding. And this one was uh, in one of Jack London's book. Jack London wrote about Carmel a lot. They had a very reciprocal arrangement. Some folks boast of quail on toast because they think it's Tony, but I'm content to owe my rent 
and live on abalone. At the time he was singing that, he was vice president of the biggest land development, second biggest land development company in the East Bay. All right, now here we take a turn. Carmel supposedly ends the heyday anyway in a suicide uh, cult where everybody takes cyanide. And the story is that all the Bohemians agreed at a certain point that to carry around cyanide on their person. So the minute that the love of life failed them or they you know, were not the bon vivants, um, they could dispatch themselves quickly. So uh, there are three cyanide deaths that are pertinent to the story. There's George Sterling up top. He dies of cyanide in the Bohemian Club, 1926. And this is not a spoiler, you can Google this. <laughs> Carrie Sterling, his wife, 1918 in the Piedmont. And then Nora Mae French, 1907, this poor woman who dies in the Sterling house and gets blamed for all of it, okay? Because she goes first. So who was Nora Mae French? Hold on a second. Here she is. Nora Mae French was a very known poet uh, even when she died at, nine, in, at the age of 26 in 1907. She had been publishing since the age of 11. She had published in every good journal in the West Coast and was publishing nationally. She published a story in the Saturday Evening Post that was on the cover. I actually have a copy of it here. Um, you can't see it so well because of the blurring but where she recounts her experience as working for the telephone company. Um, she was gorgeous and uh, she had an interesting lineage. So on the left, you see Henry Wells and on the right, Augustus French, the ninth governor of Illinois. She's the great grandniece of Wells. He started Wells Fargo and American Express. She's born in Aurora, which is a town that Wells is good as owns. But her father is also the son of the ninth governor of Illinois. And one of the problems I had when I was researching is why does she wind up so poor? Her family moves to California and becomes destitute. And I was like, why didn't any of these people bail them out? And the answer is pretty riveting, but that is a spoiler, so I won't say it. But anyway, she, is a new woman, but she rejects the Gibson girl thing entirely. She's Her hair is always a mess, as she put it. Um, she does not wear corsets. She does not cinch her waist. She has a good hiking skirt because she loves to be outdoors. So she doesn't wear a skirt that goes all the way down to the bottom often. She probably made those leather gaiters when she was working in LA as a seamstress in a leather factory for $5 a week. Okay. But she is a true, unlike the others, true bohemian nature spirit. And she would go out and camp by herself. Um, she just loved to be outside. She had a week's pot, men. Okay, here we have a picture after the earthquake. Bef uh, sometime uh, she winds up publishing a story with the journal, this gentleman, Harry Laffler edits. And they fall in love through the mail. And she decides to move to San Francisco to be with him after the earthquake, which pretty much leveled the town. So that's a pretty ballsy thing right there. Um, but what I'm gonna say about Harry Laffler is you can see that trench next to him going you know, past him and the shovel, that is a mass grave. It is just a couple of days after the earthquake. And you've got to imagine what kind of man could sit there and type, that's his typewriter, for hours and hours and hours and hours next to a mass grave. He's an interesting fella. So here is the letter that changed my project. It is by Nora Mae French, and it is in the Bancroft Library in Berkeley. Um, it is to Harry Laffler after she has moved to San Francisco, and it is about an abortion that she is um, having. She went and bought pills, and she's writing to him while she is having it. Now, you can learn a lot from archival documents. One thing I noticed immediately is Bohemian Club stationery um, was probably Harry's. He was also a member of the Bohemian Club. 
but also this looks like none of her other letters because the the uh, handwriting is just more irregular. There's it looks like she's almost pressing the paper at point. She's in the pain that she describes. Um, and that's the point where my project really started to focus in on the women, um, especially as the letter, unlike all her other letters in Harry Laffler's collection. So this is Laffler's collection, not hers, but her letters are in it. This one was missing a page. And I always wonder, huh, what did they not want us to find out? And it became a pattern in all these letters I found with George Sterling to Ambrose Bierce or, or about or, or from Nora Mae French that they had been ripped or words about Nora Mae French had been scratched out. And the more I saw how hard the men worked to kind of like shape a story about her, the more I got curious. Okay, this is the last slide I'll show and then we can discuss. Um, when she dies in the Sterling house, uh, Carrie is the only person at home. Okay, and there's a news report about it because Nora Mae French was gorgeous and um, they, the newspapers loved nothing more than a gorgeous girl's death. You know, they give it the front page. Um, and there's several there's five more pages about it. And I read about her death in about 30 different newspapers, all speculating, you know, why she, you know, decided to kill herself in the Sterling household at the tender age of 26. You see, there's some of her poetry. There's a picture of George Sterling there, um, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that was interesting as I was writing this book, people were like, why are you writing about these unknown women when the men were more famous? And I was like, by this point, I'd been staring at their faces and front pages of newspapers for quite some time. And I thought, what unknown women? They were known at the time. But over history, you know, it's like one does not die an unknown woman, woman, one becomes so over time. Their legacy got erased. So people, you know, if they hear about Nora Mae French at all, it's about the cyanide cult, when in fact, she was a much better poet than George Sterling, who winds up with uh, all the accolades. Just the last screen to say thank you. Thank you, Poison Pen, for having me. I am eager to hear your questions and um, you can see more at my website if anybody wants to follow up, so. All right, Barbara, I'm ready for you. <laughs> well, I was really, you know, as I say, fairly naive about this. It wasn't um, a focus of my life. I'm glad to say that when I said I thought of Carmela's Bohemian, that actually that was a relatively, that that impression of it was still true. Um, yes, yeah. Right, 40 years later than, than when you're writing about. But um, I had no idea about this whole land development thing, and you describe it really well. And looking at page 76 and 77, George Sterling, in the spring of 1905, you say, had signed on to be the anchor of the writing colony. And the writing colony is, I gather, uh, something that um, Frank Powers of the Pacific Improvement Company Oh, no, he's, he's the, the rival to the Pacific Improvement Company. Improvement Company has Monterey. Right. OK, if they would give Carmel Development Company 500 acres of land on their shared border, he would lure a group of writers to move to Carmel and he would have those people write to their friends and publish stories and poems and literary journals about the beauty of the area. So, I mean, basically, it's a marketing thing. Yeah. It is absolutely a marketing thing. And I think uh, one of the tougher things when I went to Carmel, it's always hard to talk to Carmel at Carmel <laughs> about like, the history. And I want to be clear, this is not the only story about Carmel. It's what the archival documents tell us. And when I went to the Carmel library to do the research, she's like, nobody asked to see the corporate records of the Carmel Development Company, but that's where this trail was. There was the meeting minutes and the stockholder, you know, reports and the, you know, who sold what to whom and this letter where he describes starting this idea. Now, it wasn't his first idea to sell the land. He also, and I didn't mention this in the book, I could have written an entire another book about the forensics accounting around it. 
but he was really broke at this time. He, he, um, he it's three years after and he's got nothing to show for it really. And uh, he tried to turn uh, a factory, the, the sand into bricks. He was going to make bricks out of the sand. That was another thing he was thinking of doing with the money. So if you think about it, like you're thinking, oh, here's someone who wants to maximize the beauty of the area. I mean, he did plant, pr- plant a lot of trees, but he was really thinking out of the box for how to make money. And it wasn't his first, second or third idea to lure bohemians there. Well, um. I I assumed, uh, as probably most people do, that the reason there was this kind of concentration of artists and writers and so forth in Carmel was they were drawn there by the, you know, the rugged beauty of the coast um, and the, you know, relatively benign climate because it is reasonably benign. Um, And possibly the the isolation of it, because as I mentioned earlier, it's not that easy to get to. Um, mm-hmm. Sort of, sort of the dynamic that you know, to some degree, went on has gone on during the pandemic, where people have, you know, thought about moving to more rural, um, less accessible places and all. But anyway, I just assumed that it was the glories of Carmel that had gotten people there. And so the the problem me, at the time, yeah, it, Barbara, you're right, you know, and but the problem at the time is the railway, the way that railways developed was. Um, they sometimes made a railway to nowhere just because they wanted to sell securities that were based on the railway companies. Right. So the way land developed was really strange, you know, and they, if you wanted to be in a remote area of California in 1902, you were spoiled for choice. There was really a lot of beauty. And so the question is, why would people move to this one square mile instead of somewhere else? Um and, you know, that's that's why they, they had competition and some people came and visited, but decided to buy into Pasadena instead or, you know, Chatsworth or here or there. So they really, you know, had to compete. And you see George writing these letters to his friends going, you know, all right, you don't want to move here, but I think this land will rise in value. Tell me right away if you'll buy it because it'll go real fast, you know, and it's the crassness of the sale is is shocking when we think about, you know, the myth of just people wanted to move here. People unfortunately didn't uh, immediately. And that was a problem for those who had invested heavily. Well, they certainly created a myth as well as um as an environment, of course, you know, Monterey Bay is a beautiful bay. Carmel Bay is much, much smaller, but I mean, it had Monterey Bay, you know, had economic, I mean, it's a great fishing place. I mean, if you go today, the aquarium is the thing to do in Monterey. I mean, the oh, aquarium yeah. is just a hard stopper. Um, but, you know, it was a, a very much a working class fishing community as far as the bay goes. So it's interesting that the railroad was coming in from the land side rather than the seaside. You know, San Francisco was a notable port, but Monterey and Carmel were not. Never, you know, I mean, why do people today, I read today, for example, that somebody's done a study about great retirement communities. Arizona, I'm happy to say, has crashed to the bottom. I'm so delighted because we're running yeah. out of water. So I'm going, yay. Yeah, but, you're done. But Florida, you know, is is like right up there on the top. And a lot of that is because of the recreational opportunities that, you know, all that coast. Of course, one day, all that coast is going to be underwater, but nobody's thinking that far ahead. Sure. Um, but that but- was not the dynamic that... Um, brought people to Carmel and Monterey, despite um, the, the wonderful. It wasn't enough. And and if you think about the Southern Pacific Railroad, they put the Hotel de Monte there and invested heavily and had the railroad. So you could get out of an express train from San Francisco under a hotel portico. This was set up. This was beautiful. But if you wanted to go that extra three miles to Carmel, you were on a horse and buggy. <laughs> that was very uncomfortable and took an hour or more. Well, I'm happy to tell you that my first trip to Arizona in 1950, you had to drive to today uh, when you left Terminal 1 at the airport and you wanted to go to the Camelback Inn, you did it in a buckboard. I in 1950, there were only no two roads in Scottsdale in 1950. It wasn't even incorporated. And today Scottsdale is knocking Beverly Hills sort of, you know, on the shoulder 
And For it sure. hasn't taken that long. So Arizona too has had the same sort of amazing growth. Um, that well, so Carmel benefited from, yeah, Carmel benefited from the earthquake of 1906 because suddenly these people who were comfortable in San Francisco are no longer comfortable in San right. Francisco. So, you know, a bunch of people came, but not enough bought and stayed um, to make it worthwhile investing in artists as a draw. Now you have to think of these bohemian artists as what today people would call influencers. Their job was to be seen having a good time, right? right. But not a scandalous time. So when Nora May French dies in their house, that's a problem, you know? <laughs> it is so, a problem. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think um, you wrote about, you know, her self-administered abortion and, yeah. you know, taking stuff like Fanny Royal was extremely chancy. I mean, if, you, if you're if you a Poldark fan, for example, mm -hmm. you will know that Elizabeth, who, you know, it tries to induce um, or induces, in fact, early childbirth for reasons I won't go into, and right. overdoses on one of these um, abortifacients and dies from it. So exactly, it was, and that's very it, real. Yeah, no, it was tremendously risky. So here, and, and you know, it's this is her second abortion, Nora's second yes. abortion. You say not her first one, but both by married men. Birth <laughs> uh, control was obviously not much of a thing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 um, it was unreliable. Um, right. and, uh, we have to go back to a time when, um, one of the things I, I think I, I noticed about this letter is, wow, this is really strange to have this because I have a colleague here who studies abortion history. We always know, you know, abortion history has been going on for, you know, centuries and centuries. And, uh, I asked her, I said, so how many first person accounts do we have of going through an abortion from the woman's point of view um, around, you know, early 1900s? And she said, hardly any. Yeah. And yeah. And so I realized, wow, I'm lucky to be reading this at all from a historian standpoint, because we know so much of attempts to legislate um, and everything, but women's, re everything about women's reproductive lives that f fell outside the very narrow spectrum of you get married, then you have kids, um, everything else, which was going on then as now, was scandalous. So, yeah, it was scandalous, but it also occurred to me, you know, reading the letter, um, she must have had PTSD of some sort, you know, I mean, to go through that experience, not once, but twice. Um, I mean, yeah. she dies at 26, right? So something really has derailed her life. Um, yeah, and, and that's something- Those experiences were part of that. The, that something starts earlier than that even um, with decisions her father made. And so she is uh, under a dark star, but creating this illuminating poetry about she's able to spin all her sorrows into very- raw and compelling poetry uh, along the way that gets published. And um, she has her periodic dark periods that she admits to, but she says, I often have my joys, which are much more enduring. The thing is after she dies, they kind of make it as if she's always been depressed, you know, like there, there was never any upside. And so you get a very, sanitized version of her. One of the things I noticed in the reports of her death, which were nationwide, and um, as you find out in the book, spans copycat suicides as far away as New York, where you know people are found having killed themselves with a poem in her pocket, their, one of her poems in their pocket. But one of the things I found fascinating about this cover, she's, nobody mentions she's the grandchild of the governor of Illinois. Nobody mentions she's Henry Wells's grandniece. And this is at a time when America is up in arms against robber barons because 1907 was the hugest crash up until the Great Depression. And they, any inkling of, you know, depravity in uh, corporate families' lives was all over the papers. And they kept those families well out. Well, you know, suicide, um, I don't want to say cults, but clusters of suicides can attach to all sorts of things. And, you know, I remember spending an entire quarter at Stanford reading good as reading good. To, oh, yeah. While we were reading Faust, um, being an opera fan, I have seen the sorrows of young Werther more than yes. once. 
And Verter is uh, part of this whole romantic thing. And, you know, he's a suicide for love. Um, yep. So yeah, I talk yeah. about that in the book as well, because he's uh, it's definitely the touch point, you know, there, there, That's you right. get these kind of like suicide crazes and young men would show up at poor Goethe's house going like, I'm going to kill myself because of love. And he's like, just, just don't, you know, I'm sorry I ever wrote that. Um, yeah. So, so that that's assumed to be the case, but the truth is there is no, um, nothing except for one person's, uh, the wife of one of the artists in Carmel, who says everyone carried suicide on their person. I couldn't find anything that suggested anything like that coordination. And the truth of what happened to people is far more sad and sorted and intimate and revealing of the gender relations than anything else. I do think the death of Nora Mae French was a horrible thing that happened that the people around her never got over in one way or another. And um, I do think uh, that this was a group of people who were having an alternative lifestyle outside the mainstream, extremely close knit, everyone sleeping with one another, you know, really attached to their own myths. And when the horrible things happened, it really didn't, the reverberations were sometimes a year or even decades later. So much of the book takes place even after Nora Mae French dies. So do you see, see parallels that. here between Nora Mae French and Sylvia Plath? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So except that, you know, uh, Nora Mae French <laughs> wasn't old enough to write more, which is really horrifying, but yeah. Um, there's ways in which we're learning a lot more about Sylvia Plath um, outside of what her, you know, ex-husband was saying and the people who survived her, who had a stake in how we viewed her death and her life and her poems. So it's, it's, it's artists, you know, and they, um, it's true that people do. I hadn't even thought about that because I had a really interesting discussion the other day um, with a different author where Caravaggio and a painting is a big thing. And so mm -hmm. we got off into a whole thing about Caravaggio um, and also Christopher Marlowe. And, you know, you're right. I think when people have, you know, lives that are, are so explosive, so out of out of the norm and, and whatever happens to them. Because Caravaggio and Christopher Marlowe died very young and, you know, in terrible very circumstances. Young. They probably both of them murdered and, you know, sorted, et cetera, et cetera. If because they are artists and, you know, we have expectations of them, but we also have, in the case of writers, their voices, or in the case of artists, you know, their visual voice, um, that we attach significance to that and it has a much greater effect than if it had been just, you know, some other, you know, a not artist person who was either murdered or died and nobody had a stake. And also artistic yeah. legacy has lots of stakeholders, economic, emotional, exactly. philosophical. And so we tend to invest their lives and deaths with a lot more than we would um, a person who maybe was just like a business person or you know, yeah, like you know, so both Harry Laffler and George Sterling were land developers. Uh, eventually, Harry Laffler was as well. And they were the editors of the volume, the posthumously published volume of Nora Mae French's poetry after her death against her family's wishes. She had well left Laffler by that point. And so they really move in to kind of like capitalize on her poetry. And, you know, as they say, they use you alive and they use you dead. And they definitely did with her. So did you, I don't know spoilers here, but so don't answer it specifically, but did you find a reason that satisfies you for her suicide or is it largely inexplicable? Um, so I actually uh, will never say what I think happened that night. <laughs> okay. I don't want people to come to their own conclusions and have knocked down drag outs. What I do say in the book is the reports of her death are literally unbelievable. Like they're literally don't add up. They don't make sense in any way and um, disturbed me, you know, greatly when I was reading them. But the two people closest to the book, I would say who've read it the most, my agent and my editor, they have two different reads on what happened that night. 
<laughs> well, let's move on to Carrie and George. I mean, because all yeah. of them die from suicide. Do you do you think there's a causal connection? You know, is it like dominoes or or do you want to share that maybe you'd rather people read the book and discovered it? You know, I will say that um, it, it it's all related to what happened the night Nora died. Okay. And should we get some sort of picture in the book of what happened? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to drag it out of her people. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so, but what, you know, the way I wrote this book, Barbara, to be honest, I, I wanted to take people with me in the archives and to look at the evidence that I have. It's not a complete picture. And with women's lives, we often don't get a complete picture because, you know, as I mentioned, the records are usually preserved around men. Um, Nora Mae French's have been altered a lot. Uh, the newspapers lied. These people lied to the newspapers, each other, and George Sterling even lied to his own diary, which I discuss. They really, uh, you have to triangulate, you know, I, I would just triangulate all sorts of sources to figure out. Um, so, you know, there's moments where the reader is going to have to come to their own conclusion. Well, and I, you know, this is a term. It's, it's fun. Kind of, it should be fun. <laughs> well, it is. But, you know, I'm going to go back to your opening remarks because this is a term that has come into vogue. And in a way, it's sort of oxymoronic. But, you know, narrative nonfiction, I love that. Um, but basically, what it means is that you're, you're taking real things, real events, and you are storytelling you are using yes. those as you know on, and so what you wind up with is nonfiction that reads like a novel and right. inevitably in order to do that that you you interpolate things into what's known um you know, and there are moments after that you know we can't know for sure yeah. about seminal events and i mean about about not the seminal events but the interstices that occur um, in those events in people's lives. So the biographer interprets them, right? Yes. And, so and what I did was... The truth. And that's what you're doing in this. Yeah. Part. So the only difference is uh, at, at key moments, I say, I'm interpreting here. I right. mean, I don't know what you think this means, but this is what I think. So, you know, I, I kind of invite that. And um, I like that because I like I like archives. I like the experience of discovery of being in them. And I want people to have that discovery experience rather than me wrapping up the tale and saying, this is how it went. Because there are some things where I'm not sure. But I did have to come to a moment where I was like, okay, either we just keep telling the same stories about men over and over again, because that's where the records are. There's tons of records about Jack, Stern, uh, Jack London you know, 66,000 in the Huntington alone, you know, so we could write endless books about Jack London. But if we're going to get the woman's perspective, there's going to be more gaps. And we have to do our level best to connect the dots and be clear when we're connecting. Well, you have to bring some of the novelist skill set along, but you also have to bring an investigator's skill set along because, you know, really what you're doing is working a cold case here. You know, I am. you're following the evidence, <laughs> you're doing the research and all, and, you know, you're coming up with, I mean, you know, this could be Michael Connolly or, you know, it could be- exactly. It is totally a cold case. You nailed it. It's a cold it case. No, it's really fascinating. I had marked something else, damn it. And now I lost my, um, but one of the things, when you were talking about the new women, I think it's way, very back at the beginning, you were talking about books that were being written um, at this at this time. Um, in which women were uh, the heroines. I wish I hadn't pulled my. Oh, oh, I know. Yes, and the they both... real stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I thought that that was, um, you know, part of what was happening at the turn of the 20th century. Is that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Carrie Sterling and Nora Mae French are like the real life heroines in those books, right. and like those real life heroines, women, real women at the time bore all the consequences of the loosening of sexual codes going on yep. in these bohemian environments. And so, you know, in those novels, as my colleague Stephanie Foote would point out, women get to go and do new things, but at the end, they're always punished for it. <laughs> I still sort of, you know, have a little bit of a whatever when I read so casually about, you know, hookup sites. 
and so forth, because, you know, reliable birth control didn't really come into play until I was in my twenties. And one of the, one of the worst things that could happen to you was to get pregnant, you know, when you, when you didn't even know how to chart your life's course. And all of a sudden there you might be with the responsibility of a child or the painful decision to have an illegal abortion or whatever it is. You and we still barely do. talk about it. But, you know, once we got to really reliable contraception, whether it was an IUD or whatever it all is, um, then sexual freedom for women became really on a par with sexual freedom for men. And now, you know, as I say, you have hookup sites, you know, where people can. And, and I mean, to me, this is still something of a foreign language, but um, I am old enough where I, I predate the swipe left, swipe right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I'm probably never going to swipe right because I, you know, I've been married now for to this husband for you know 30, 30 yeah. years, thirty one years coming up, and at eighty, I probably don't care anyway. Yeah, right, but, exactly. Um, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, it, they were swiping right and left back then, but just when it went wrong, it went wrong really well, bad they for were. the women. Absolutely, it's the same mm-hmm. thing, obviously, for Nora. You know, she obviously <laughs> swiped right twice and. Uh, <laughs> But she ended up with, you know, with life changing, certainly psyche changing consequences. Yeah. But even yeah. beyond abortion, there's another friend of theirs who dies of uremia in pregnancy. And there's another, um, Charmy in London had a terrible birth. Her their, their kid dies in three days and the surgeon butchered her uterus that she's never able to have another child. So the all of this is, is sort of humming along in the background that whether this went well or not, and Carrie is from the beginning, like, I want no part of that. You know, because she can tell, like, you know, you engage in reproduction, you die early or live miserably from what she saw. So she's constantly like, why would even Charmian try to have another kid? That's crazy. Well, we don't we don't think of childbirth today as being nearly as risky as it was. I mean, people used to die of what was called puerperal or childbed fever. And, you know, it was propagated because people went from birth to birth. Midwives all didn't bother to wash their hands. Mm -mm. Those people didn't know about germ theory. You know, they're, I mean, you know, Queen Victoria pioneered the use of of ether as an anesthesia during really painful childbirth. But, Mm -hmm. you know, up until then, um, anytime a woman got pregnant, you know, you were rolling the dice. I had 45 hours of labor. I would have died. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you know, it was um, it was a really dreadful thing. And if you watched, yeah. say you watched Downton Abbey and you discovered, you know, when the younger daughter, the middle daughter, I guess it is, you know, dies, maybe she was the younger one, um, in pregnancy is because I'm trying to remember, um, eclampsia. Nobody yeah. knew to do anything about that. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that. There's no, you know, they did they lived far enough from doctors that they didn't go, or doctors were expensive, so they didn't feel like they that could was go. Years ago, you know, yes. in the scheme of things is not that long ago. So we're very fortunate yeah. that modern medicine has made um made pregnancy and childbirth. And I want I'm not going to go into abortion politics, but I do right. think that it's wonderful that women have much more control over their lives as a result of having more control over reproduction. So this is where I end the book a bit. There is a figure who comes out of Carmel, a young woman who then goes on to become one of the greatest muckrakers, I think, of last century, pursuing juvenile justice issues, women's, uh, you know, uh, she gets a letter from Planned Parenthood, which at the time is a very early organization. And she really gets it, you know, that women have to, you know, have some sort of freedom and and writes about this. And it's a shame. Her name was Vera Connolly. And somebody should take that baton and write a book about her because she was amazing. Well, maybe it will be you. So maybe. I see we're coming up on the hour and I need to get Patrick back to see if we have any questions. But I want to say oh, that right. really this book reads with the, with the force of a novel. Um, it, it's really true crime, but you get to you get to look at all sorts of things. You get to look at new women, the changing roles of women. You get to look at land development and speculation. You get to look at railroads and other sorts of you know um, economic drivers. You get to look at suicide and other stuff, and you get to hang out with some well-known writers like say Jack London that you might not have expected. So it's really an amazing book. Um, Thank you. Which I highly recommend. Patrick, come join us. And if you're not completely stupefied, do you have any comments or questions? <laughs>
<laughs> completely stupefied. This is fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I think the audience might be stupefied, though. Um, I don't see any real <laughs> questions. That's fine. That's fine. Um, That's all right. They will develop as people watch and listen to this. It's funny because I've been reading little samples throughout the text while you guys have been talking. Yeah. And I really admire your the style, the way you've the way you've approached, because you know, often one of my gripes with the whole narrative nonfiction thing uh, or approach, and also some true crime, is uh, when the author will lapse into you know, Sam must have been thinking about his you know the upcoming fall, yeah. you know, like putting thoughts into the characters' minds that were completely invented. Um, and I like how you go stick to the facts. Uh, and stitch. Yeah, and I won't say that I don't, you know, th so the thing is, I didn't want to do the must haves, one thing. Right, um, so, right. you know, at the times that we're wandering in Carrie's or Nora's minds, it's, it's always got some root in some letter where they've expressed something that so all of that prologue, for example, when she's describing how she thinks, and I kind of narrate it through, if you read the whole letter, you'll see all those things that she's saying. Um, so I just just trying to weave it into a more readable way. With it, with all these factual touchstones along the way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that's the other thing. I mean, I think one of the cautions um, that came out of my research is don't just believe the newspapers. Don't even just believe the letters. You know, you really have to get several points of view before you can write a scene and, and get an understanding of what the different biases were in representing what happened. Well, William Randolph Hearst was very much a presence by this time, wasn't he? Well, yeah, he hired Ambrose Bierce to go and write about the railroads um, lobbying government. And that's what took Beers out of the Bay Area to DC. Beers at that point had called, what do you call CP Huntington? Um, what, uh, 36 of the surviving 40 thieves? Because at that point, Stanford had died and the other guy had died. <laughs> Yeah, he, the robber he barons, a, right? Yeah, the robber barons. So he he's uh he and George, there's a ton of correspondence between him and George Sterling, because he's assured George Sterling that he's like the next Keats. So this is part of why George wants to move to Carmel. He's convinced he can live on his poetry, which he can't. But um Beers tells him he's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he believes it. And he's not actually, and he was acknowledged as not at the time. There were terrible reviews of his work. And did, wasn't Beers the one who disappeared down in Mexico? Yeah, yes, he absolutely. did. Absolutely, he's been the subject of a number of both nonfiction and fictional treatments of what happened. You know, nobody knows for sure what happened. The old nobody green. knows. And George, in fact, takes on critics for Beers all the time, and there are many. Beers was a very polarizing figure, and George like carries his you know um, flag. But it, after Beers's death, he says he, he did not kill himself. He would never do that. Da 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 da. So yeah. He becomes, he becomes B. Traven. No, yeah. <laughs> probably not. No, he's, he does write to his, his niece, Laura. He's like, if, if I'm shot up against a wall by Mexicans, that's a good way to go. Don't mourn. If I'm shot to rags against the wall. Like, so he says, I don't care if I die there. And people took that as a suicide note. So George is like, oh, no. No, my mentor would never commit suicide. Whereas for Nora, they're working overtime to make sure everybody knows that she was like suicidal every minute of her life. Well, they've clearly never heard about suicide by cop then, you know, or, you know, people who put themselves <laughs> into situations. So in fact, they force other people to kill them, which really yeah. is suicide. Yeah, it's true. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Beers is a big figure, Jack London is a big figure, and Jack London is the reason a lot of these people burn their letters, because they instruct each other often to burn letters after they write them. Obviously, they didn't, or I wouldn't read it, but when George Sterling is discovered in the Bohemian Club, there's a pile of ash on his desk. He burned his letters before he killed himself, and uh, Beers wrote to him, everyone should burn their letters. It's the only way to go, you know? They were very conscious and particularly because Jack Lennon had been savaged in the news after his marriage broke up and he chose to mar marry Charmian instead. So always so careful. London packed a lot into his, what was it 40 years, 41 years, something like yes, that? Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. And um, he's kind of a, 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 on the sidelines of this text 
But the frenemy relationship between Carrie Sterling and Charmy in London was delightful to find, you know? Like, yeah, that runs throughout the book. They are just like frenemies of a hundred years ago. It's great. Did they seem very contemporary when you were writing about them? Oh you? my gosh, yes. I recognize these women immediately. And, um, you know, Nora first, because I have a lot of clever friends and her, her voice as a writer was just so clear in her letters. Uh, Carrie took me a little longer to kind of relate to, um, but my uncle, who unfortunately died in 2020, was reading an early draft of it, and he she turned out to be the only one he liked. And I realized, oh my gosh, my grandmother, my uncle's mom, grew up in an Irish industrial school, you know, emigrated to the United States at the age of 18, and was like, I'm not going to be married uh, to just some pauper. I'm going to marry up did not glamorize poverty. She had TB and everything. She was just like, no. And she would have had no patience with this crowd whatsoever. So all of a sudden I could see Carrie's eye rolling, you know, throughout, through a different lens. Wow. Can you talk, I was reading a little bit about your academic work and, and um, sure. can you talk a little bit about that? And also um, what sort of courses do you teach? Okay, so I was thinking this was a huge departure for me, um, but it was funny when the Wall Street Journal review came out and said, you know, tenacious research with humorous asides, one of my colleagues in the field said, oh, that's you, it's in every article. And I, I always have had this voice that comes through articles that um, sometimes in grad school, they're like, you write a little too well, like that's a problem in academia. <laughs> But I definitely did a lot of archival work and um, that comes through in this. Uh, when I teach qualitative methods, I like wear the house t-shirt, everybody lies because I want everybody to triangulate their data, whether they're interviewing someone or they've got a, you know, an artifact or something. And so I, I'm no stranger to the archives or trying to find, you know, truth in very disparate accounts. And I'm always listening for, um, I feel like truth is sometimes comes through the gaps, that thing that people stop or they pause or they make a joke out of rather than finish the thought. Like to me, those are always the most revealing moments. So when I was going through the letters, that's where I went. I'm thinking that perhaps academic writing does not encourage the writer to be engaging. Not you know, so much, they have no. Their own voice. <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm serious. I'm um, serious too. Yeah, no, it doesn't. And uh, eventually I was like, well, I could write another monograph or I could do something different. And I, I feel as a professor that if we in the humanities cannot engage the public in the findings of our research, we're doomed. You know, we need to speak outside of our, you know, ivory towers. And so I really wanted to make sure that happened. Now, it was not a flick of the switch. Trade publishing is not the same as academic publishing. I learned a lot about it. And um, now I teach a course that a lot of creative writers take about how to send your work out there and, you know, look for, you know, opportunities. It's called writing for money. So I've used this sort of experience in the teaching. Excellent. Do you get to teach any lit courses at your level? Yeah, right now I'm teaching. Um, what am I teaching right now? So, oh, no, last semester I taught uh, disability and literature. So we read uh -huh. Oedipus, Jane Eyre, you know, all kinds of stuff where dis disability figures prominently. Christy, Christy Brown. Christy wrote, Brown? Wasn't it Christy Brown who wrote My Left Foot? Oh, yeah. No, we, so we, we are with the classics. Like this is oh, like I things see. that would appear on a, you know, Victorian syllabus or something. But we're focusing on disability. So Oedipus with his lame foot. Um, and that's the reason he solves the Sphinx riddle and Tiresias, the blind prophet. So the disability is riven throughout literature. And, and uh, so, yeah, I have. If I didn't hate Moby Dick, I'd teach that one. <laughs> I'm a recovering English major, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> at least you're recovering. <laughs> yeah. Recovered, hopefully. Recovered, yes. Yeah. No, I love it. And I, and right now I'm teaching a little film and a little critical theory and, you know, I get to, I have an immense freedom in my job and I'm very glad for it, but this really um, was a departure for me. And uh, I, I'm going to write more books like this. I really enjoy it. 
Well, wonderful, because I think you've done a marvelous job. I was totally engaged from start to finish, and I learned many things. So, you know, it's hard to beat that recipe. I've always thought that people who read crime fiction do it in part to learn stuff, because you yes. do inevitably in any really good mystery, you always learn things. And so, That's so right. Um, it's, it's about the scene. You know, it's a continual learning process. And um, so you wind up with people like Patrick and me, we have these kind of rag bag, you know, minds just filled with all kinds of stuff that right. the ordinary person, I know how to defense a body. I'm not ever going to do it, but you know, I know how. Um, and then, or near a wolf. You learn a lot about orchids while you're doing it. Yeah. Yep. Also interesting. Ingredient. They're mm. also interesting time capsules, depending upon what yes. you're reading. And so you can oh, see. Oh, they are. But, you know, it also, I really believe it's true. Somebody wrote about crime fiction, which I've often said that it, the best of it tends to, it cuts along the edge of social change because you're, you're looking for conflict. You're looking for reasons for, for people to kill and, you know, people to commit crimes and so forth. And, and I do think that crime fiction is very good at, um, you know, exploring social change as we, as we move along. You've just explained me to me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And, you know, I've, I've read two or three books recently by writers who I have to assume are under 40, and it's almost as though I'm stepping into a whole new dimension. Um, and and I'm, I mean, that's how I know about hookups and swiping right, because it's not part of my own experience. Yeah, crime but, is harder um, when you've got cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm, really, I'm really fascinated with it. And I think it's, you know, it's important to, um, to keep up, so to speak. And, um, and it's a reading crime fiction or your, you know, is a wonderful way to do that. There are many parallels in your book between the time then and the time now. Yes. Many parallels. And so, yes. you know, if, if we hope that learning the past informs us in the present, uh, that's a wonderful thing. This has been wonderful, Catherine. Thank you for yes, your time and you. for the wonderful slideshow. That was really beautifully done. Thank you. I had all these photographs. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to show it. And I really, I really have enjoyed this talk, Barbara and Patrick. So thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure indeed. Um, I will send you links. There will be, oh, right. We have our signed book place for anyone who wants to. And I mean, this is a book you could actually give to any reader since we're coming up to the gift giving season. And I'm gonna repeat that October is the new December and for sure November is the new December because the supply and shipping um, systems are in total disarray. So yes. think about it right now. Um, there will be a podcast available and um, the video is gonna live on forever on Facebook and YouTube on our channels. So please recommend to people you think would enjoy it. Uh, they have an opportunity to listen or to visit. Right. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Catherine, Thank you. Good night, pleasure. everyone. Thanks for listening. You bet. Come and see us again. Bye.